And since this is the last speech that I will give as president, I think it's fitting to leave one final thought, an observation about a country which I love. It was stated best in a letter I received not long ago. A man wrote me and said, you can go to live in France, but you cannot become a Frenchman. You can go to live in Germany or Turkey or Japan, but you cannot become a German, a Turk or Japanese. But anyone from any corner of the, earth, of the earth can come to live in America and become an American. This, I believe, is one of the most important sources of America's greatness. We lead the world because, unique among nations, we draw our people, our strength, from every country and every corner of the world. And by doing so, we continuously renew and enrich our nation. While other countries cling to the stale past here in America, we breathe life into dreams, we create the future, and the world follows us into tomorrow. Thanks to each wave of new arrivals to this land of opportunity, we're a nation forever young, forever bursting with energy and new ideas, and always on the cutting edge, always leading the world to the next frontier. This quality is vital to our future as a nation. If we ever close the door to new Americans, our leadership in the world would soon be lost. In some respects, the Republican Party of Ronald Reagan is not that different from the one of Donald Trump. Both are similar in general economic policies with a dedication to trickle-down economics and tax cuts for the wealthy. In foreign policy, both have used the phrase peace through strength and called for a stronger military. Some of the same faces from the Reagan administration have also shaped Trump's presidency, including neoconservative hawks like John Bolton and Elliot Abrams. But where the two diverge heavily is their approach to immigration. Ronald Reagan took a centrist position. In 1986, he signed the Immigration Reform and Control Act, which would punish employers who hire undocumented immigrants. But the same legislation also granted amnesty to 3 million undocumented immigrants who had arrived in the country prior to 1982. Three and a half decades later, however, the Republican Party has become adamantly opposed to any proposal for immigration reform that would include amnesty. In fact, the GOP has even doubled down in their xenophobia. As of 2023, virtually the entire Republican presidential primary field from Ron DeSantis and Nikki Haley joined Trump in opposing birthright citizenship. The right granted in the 14th Amendment of the U.S. Constitution that gives citizenship to anyone born in the country. Now, the conventional wisdom traces the recent reinvention of the GOP as a nativist party promoting strong borders and denying amnesty to undocumented immigrants to Donald Trump's campaign for president in 2016. And sure enough, his infamous denigration of Mexicans in his announcement speech represents an apex in this transformation. But I would like to argue in this video essay that what we now call Trumpism did not necessarily start with Donald Trump, but with a figure that you may not even have heard of. You might not remember him, but this nerdy looking economics professor is Dave Bratt, and you can thank him for paving the way to Donald Trump's presidency. Like Trump in 2016, Bratt managed to pull off one of the most stunning upsets in recent American electoral history. In the 2014 Virginia Congressional Republican primary, Bratt took on sitting House Majority Leader Eric Cantor. Despite being outraised by Cantor by more than 10 to 1, and having only two hired staffers, including a 23-year-old campaign manager who handled communications with a Walmart flip phone, Bratt managed to succeed and he became the first person in history to defeat a sitting house majority leader in an American primary election. 
One reason you might not have heard of Dave Brat is that he literally ran away from the spotlight. On the day after he defeated House Majority Leader Eric Cantor, as the media were eager to meet the giant slayer and the new face of the Republican Party, Brat merely drove out of his driveway, rolled down his car windows to speak briefly to CNN. And uh, I'll be with you as soon as I can. Uh, just so happy with the uh, outcome of the election. And I, I, I literally have a thousand emails, a thousand voicemails. So I'm just trying to catch up on everything. I'm, I'm going to take a few days with my family and just uh, let it all soak in and enjoy it. And uh, thank you all for, uh, for being here. I, I apologize that I, I don't have enough time to, to spend with everybody. But uh, thanks. And that's it for today. I got to go get my hair cut. All, all right. right. Thanks so much, sir. All right. Thank you, guys. It. See ya. Sure. Today, Dave Bratt probably regrets his decision to ignore the press that day. Although his stunning victory ended up changing the course of the Republican Party, setting the agenda for the GOP's hardline stance on immigration, Bratt is now little more than a forgotten relic of the conservative movement. Perhaps he might have done more to take advantage of his sudden celebrity. A few years after Bratt's win, New York Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez pulled off a similar conquest when she defeated incumbent Joe Crowley, who had been second in line for the House leadership. Like Dave Bratt, Ocasio-Cortez was also outraised by 10 to 1 and pulled off a stunning upset. But the difference is that Ocasio-Cortez quickly seized the spotlight giving interviews to the media and also appearing on late night TV. She turned her initials AOC into a household name. In contrast to AOC embracing her popularity, perhaps Bratt could not absorb or handle the stress of fame. In any case, he soon faded from view, and his time in Congress would last only two terms. In 2018, four years after his earth-shaking victory, he lost his seat in a general election to a Democrat. Still, even if Bratt is mostly forgotten, his campaign offers a compelling case study, one that can help us understand the state of the Republican Party today. Dave Bratt's victory against Eric Cantor in the 2014 Virginia Republican primary foreshadowed the trajectory of the American conservative movement. And perhaps if Bratt had seized the spotlight and if we all had paid more attention, Donald Trump's success in 2016 might have been more predictable. In addition to exploring Bratt's campaign and stunning upset, I also hope, by the end of this episode, to answer a key question that currently divides many political scientists. Did Trump win because of class, or did he win because of race? When it comes to establishing your worldview, I was curious, what newspapers and magazines did you regularly read before you were tapped for this to stay informed and to understand the I've world. read most of them, again, with a great appreciation for the press, for the media. But like what coming, ones specifically? I'm curious that you... Um, all of them, any of them that um, have, have been in front of me over all these years. It may not seem like such a long time ago, but the Republican Party during the Obama era was very different from the one after Trump's rise. Prior to the historic 2016 presidential election, the conservative movement faced an ideological fork in the road. There was a void in leadership, as the former Republican President George W. Bush became quite unpopular with the base of his own party towards the end of his two terms in office. This was in sharp contrast to Democratic voters, who tended to have more favorable views of past Democratic presidents. Even the Democratic congressional leadership, like Nancy Pelosi, remained quite popular both within her district and the party as a whole. But by the end of Bush's second term, the Republican voter was angry with the Republican leadership who were now starting to feel the heat from the grassroots. This, too, was in contrast to the Democratic leadership who had little to fear from its activist left flank. The response to this crisis among the GOP leadership was to re-energize their base. In 2008, faced with a likely defeat by the superstar Barack Obama, the Republican Party took a gamble and teamed up their presidential nominee John McCain with a conservative hardliner, Sarah Palin. 
McCain's eventual failure in the presidential election might have caused some in the Republican leadership to balk at fielding future quote-unquote rogue populists to defeat the Democrats. But with the inauguration of Barack Obama, the base of the Republican Party veered even further towards Sarah Palin's brand of right-wing populism, and they rejected the more establishment conservatism of John McCain and George W. Bush. This set the stage for the Tea Party movement. On February 19, 2009, speaking in front of the Chicago Stock Exchange, CNBC reporter Rick Santelli delivered an infamous rant against Obama's mortgage plan, which concluded with the promise to form a Tea Party movement. The viral video captivated conservative viewers and spurred many to mobilize. A Chicago Tea Party in July. All you capitalists that want to show up to Lake Michigan, I'm going to start organizing. What are you jumping in? What are you jumping in this time? We should pause to note the irony attending the fact that this quote-unquote populist movement traces its origins to a member of the mainstream liberal media surrounded by hedge fund managers. Be that as it may, the Tea Party movement would develop after Santelli's speech and proved to be very successful at galvanizing the Republican base during the remainder of Obama's presidency. The new Tea Party was not just a new ideological wing. With funding coming from billionaire backers, it developed a strong get-out-the-vote operation and trained supporters to knock on doors and make phone calls. Importantly, while benefiting from big money, it remained a populist movement on the surface. Take, for instance, Glenn Beck's FreedomWorks, one of the more successful Tea Party organizations and one that played a pivotal role in the Republican victory of the 2010 midterms. Backed by this popular TV personality, FreedomWorks organized what they called quote-unquote boot camps for the endorsed candidates, training them on talking points and ways to handle the media. They required its staffers to absorb the material on reading lists that included the texts ranging from the ideological works of Ayn Rand to organizing lessons from the left-wing Saul Alinsky. Leading up to the midterms, FreedomWorks also organized a successful Rally to Restore Honor, drawing about 100,000 attendees to Washington, D.C. The event was famously mocked by liberal comedians Jon Stewart and Stephen Colbert, who responded later that year with their own rally to restore sanity. Although Stewart and Colbert's quote-unquote protest attracted an equally large crowd to D.C., a few days later, in the midterm election of 2010, the GOP gained 63 seats to flip the House. It was the largest House swing since 1948. The Tea Party won, and Glenn Beck got the last laugh. In addition to a successful organizing and get-out-the-vote operation, one of the ways Tea Party Republicans differed from the more traditional Republican establishment was in the adamant opposition to collaboration or bipartisanship with the Democratic Party. An interesting illustration of this shift can be seen with the issue of climate change. As hard as it is to believe today, Republican leaders, once upon a time, supported measures to address the climate crisis. In 2008, for instance, former House Speaker Newt Gingrich even did an ad with Democratic Speaker Nancy Pelosi saying that, while they didn't see eye to eye on every issue, they believed bipartisanship was needed to address climate change. After the Tea Party wave of 2010, Gingrich not only repudiated the ad, he went on to deny the existence of climate change. In this sudden about face, Gingrich was voicing a view that is now shared with the entirety of the new Republican delegation in Congress. In this change, we can virtually pinpoint the moment the Republican leadership began to acknowledge the new reality. They went from believing in climate change and an all of the above solution to energy during the Bush years to denying the crisis completely. While the effect of the Tea Party was swift and dramatic, there was still very little daylight between its representatives in Congress and the more establishment Republican leadership when it came to most policies. Tax cuts for the rich? Check. More defense funding? Check. Austerity measures and gutting the welfare state? Check, check. 
even with the new faces in the party, the leadership still had general control over its main priorities and could whip the party to support its traditional business-friendly agenda. But this spear of cooperation would evaporate in 2014. You're looking at a system with John Boehner, John Cornyn, Lindsey Graham, John McCain, Chuck Schumer, Harry Reid, Nancy Pelosi, they're all the same. They're all the same. While the Republican drift to the right began with Sarah Palin and the Tea Party movement of 2010, it underwent a sharper and more decisive turn during Obama's second administration. That was when the simmering anger of the new Republican base toward its leadership changed into outright determination to punish them. We get a taste of the growing intolerance for establishment Republicans in a 2014 conservative conference where Glenn Beck told a cheering crowd that Let me tell you something, Mitch McConnell is as big of a danger to this country as Barack Obama is. The progressive disease is in both parties. In the same year, FreedomWorks joined a conservative coalition in circulating a petition to fire House Speaker John Boehner for his alleged support for amnesty. Even right-wing hardliners like Senator Lindsey Graham could not escape the Tea Party and were suddenly forced to deal with the new threat coming in the form of a serious primary challenge. It was around this time that the use of the acronym RINO, for Republicans in name only, became more of a common insult within conservative circles. And among the long list of rhinos that the Tea Party movement designated as traitors, House Majority Leader Eric Cantor of Virginia. Eric Cantor was something of a political animal, having been an elected official since becoming a member of the Virginia House of Delegates way back in 1992. When he was elected to Congress in the same year that George W. Bush was first elected president, Cantor was widely considered one of the more conservative members of the House. By the time he became House Minority Whip in 2009, he was unquestionably one of the most influential Republican leaders in D.C. In fact, he was even on the shortlist of John McCain's potential running mates before Sarah Palin got the final nod. For a man with a political career as long as Eric Cantor's, it may seem quite odd that he did not see the wrath of the Tea Party coming in his direction. We might have expected him to have a better finger on the pulse of his own party. But Cantor's success may have been the problem. Perhaps hubris allowed him to take his congressional district for granted and to spend most of his time in D.C. or at lavish out-of-state fundraising parties. Schmoozing political donors was certainly lucrative, but the money may have also blinded Cantor or jaded him a bit. Cantor had so much cash during his 2014 primary that he spent over $168,000 on steak dinners at two restaurants alone. Compare that to the $122,000 that his opponent Dave Bratt had spent for his entire campaign at that point. With ringing endorsements from groups like the National Rifle Association, Cantor also seems to have felt it unnecessary to seek support from local groups within his own district. Case in point, when a Virginia-based gun rights group of about 26,000 supporters asked Cantor to complete a simple endorsement questionnaire, the House Majority Leader brushed off the request. The gun rights group responded by making anti-Cantor robocalls to GOP voters in his district. Still, Cantor never seems to have cared for any organization that could not max out donations to his campaign, even if there were local groups that could have helped get out the vote. His top donors were either Wall Street or real estate. They included the infamous Blackstone Group and Goldman Sachs, who both played pivotal roles in the foreclosure crisis. Cantor is a good example of a politician who relies almost entirely on a massive war chest, believing that it, and it alone, is the key to political success. And, to be fair, there were lots of reasons for thinking this was correct. Even the Tea Party was initially wary of endorsing Cantor's rival in the primary due to the extent of the incumbent's war chest, 
The National Tea Party group certainly wanted to oust Cantor, but even they didn't think it would be worth their effort and resources to endorse a long shot like Dave Bratt. But the success of political fundraising must not be measured in pure dollar amounts alone. Even if Dave Bratt was outspent by more than 10 to 1 in the primary, he did have one advantage when it came to funding. The vast majority of donations to Bratt's campaign came directly from Virginia voters. This was in stark contrast to Eric Cantor, who mostly received his contributions from donors in Los Angeles, West Palm Beach, Washington DC, and New York City. So while Cantor could boast support from major conservative organizations like the NRA, and while the National Tea Party PACs were skittish about backing his opponent, Bratt's fundraising numbers clearly indicated that he, and not Cantor, was the one getting local support. This image clearly did not work to Cantor's advantage, but the elitist label alone was not the ultimate deal breaker for voters. That distinction would belong to another issue that would ultimately determine the outcome of the election. And it is time to provide an opportunity for legal residence and citizenship for those who are brought to this country as children and who know no other home. I'm pleased that many of my colleagues in both chambers of Congress on both sides of the aisle have begun work in good faith to address these issues. Cantor's nebulous position on immigration would prove to be the final straw for the base of the party. The mixture of an out-of-touch politician combined with policies on immigration that seemed to benefit the wealthy was a cocktail that angry Virginia voters were no longer going to swallow. As we have seen, the Republican establishment after the 2010 midterms was willing to go along with the Tea Party on some issues, such as climate change, and dramatically adjust their positions. But, in that same period, Immigration was an issue where the GOP leadership and the base of the party did not see eye to eye. Again, this may seem surprising because of what has happened since, but the Republican establishment was not so quick to adopt the hardline anti-immigration stance of the Tea Party faction. The party leadership was, even after their remarkable success in the 2010 midterms, concerned about looming demographic changes and their eventual effect on future elections. The difference was in their approach to the problem. In the presidential election of 2012, Barack Obama won 71% of the Latino vote. This was in contrast to the George W. Bush years, when Democrats only won a slight majority of Latinos. And with the Hispanic community growing in size, and with the white population of America expected to lose its majority share of the U.S. population by 2045, the Republican leadership felt the urgency to respond. Their solution was not to stem the growth of Latinos and other minority populations, but to try to attract more non-white voters to their tent. The Republican establishment, at this stage, was still more neoliberal than nationalistic and placed their emphasis on increasing economic growth. They generally believed in the free movement of both capital as well as labor, and they were not instinctively disposed to anti-immigration policies. The elevation to prominence of Latino Republicans like Marco Rubio of Florida and Ted Cruz of Texas around the Obama years was no accident. It can be seen as part of the attempt to broaden the demographic base of the Republican Party. When Jeb Bush launched an exploratory committee in 2014 for his eventual run for president, the Florida governor and younger brother of President George W. Bush was confident that his Spanish-speaking skills and mixed-race family would be positive assets for his candidacy. In retrospect, Marco Rubio and Jeb Bush should have realized that any policy that peeled soft on immigration, including an emphasis on courting the Latino vote, was doomed to fail. The writing was on the wall, in this case, came in the form of Dave Bratt's upset win against Eric Cantor in 2014. This election sent the signal that the base of the Republican Party was not going to tolerate policies that would accelerate the changes taking place in the racial demographics of America. It clearly pointed out the new direction in which the party was headed. If the GOP leadership had paid attention, they could have foreseen as early as 2014 the eventual rise of a candidate like Donald Trump. 
In their respective responses to demographic change, we see a key ideological difference between the Republican establishment and the Tea Party populace. The establishment, as we have seen, wanted to court Latino voters with immigration reform. The Tea Party, however, did not accept demographic change as inevitable, and they chose to resist. Far more nationalistic than neoliberal, they focused on America first and called for secure borders. America first, of course, became a rallying cry of Trump's MAGA crowd in 2016. But it is worth noting that there was an America First PAC back in 2014, two years before Trump. And what's more, the biggest donation made by this PAC in 2014 cycle was none other than Dave Bratt. So where was Eric Cantor in all this? As I said earlier, he checked off most of the right-wing boxes. On guns, he was 100% with the NRA. On abortion, 0% for Planned Parenthood. But Cantor was, nonetheless, one of those Republican leaders who responded to fears of demographic change with a willingness to broaden the Republican tent. It's important that voters see a Republican party that is inclusive and not exclusive, he said. And so, around 2013, during Obama's second term, Cantor flirted with the idea of creating a pathway to citizenship for undocumented immigrants who had entered the country as children. Make no mistake, despite what now sounds like a rather progressive position, Cantor was by no means popular with pro-immigration advocacy groups. Since his days as a member of the Virginia legislature, he had always insisted on more border security as a requirement to any bill that might grant citizenship to undocumented immigrants. This track record, however, was not enough for the new base of the party. Any proposal that smacked of amnesty for what they called illegals was completely unacceptable to the grassroots of the GOP. Cantor's perceived softness on immigration was a deal breaker. The magnitude of the Tea Party fears of immigration is reflected in their choice of Dave Bratt as the standard barrier for the cause. As someone who had spent his professional life in academia, Bratt really didn't have the most fitting resume as a conservative nor did he have the charisma of someone who could lead a major movement. But immigration had become such a potent issue for the right wing that they were ready to overlook any other shortcomings. To get a sense of Dave Bratt's appeal, we need only to look at a speech he made when he announced his candidacy on January 10, 2014. He opened his speech with familiar Republican cliches. He mentioned how people often told him how that America was heading in the wrong direction, how Obama and Pelosi were ruining the country, etc., etc. But, in the middle of his speech, Bratt struck a chord that clearly differentiated himself from most other Republican candidates. It showed the right-wing base that maybe, just maybe, there was someone who could topple House Speaker Cantor and send a strong message to the rest of the Republican establishment. The chord that resonated so well with the right was his rehearsal of populist principles and a heartfelt sympathy for the everyday man. In the middle of his speech, Bratt said, The ability of the American people to dream takes a hit when the government takes over health care, robbing them of their ability to choose their insurance, keep their doctor, and maintain control over their health. It takes a hit when Eric Cantor and others spend their political capital fighting for amnesty, letting others cut in line ahead of hard-working Americans. Dreams seem further from our grasp when our leaders mortgage the future of our children and grandchildren for the sake of political expediency. And the dream of our democracy fades from view when our representatives devote their energies to serving big business, Wall Street, and their political donors rather than Main Street, you, and your family. Every sentence in this part of Bratt's speech underscores an us-versus-them struggle. And in each case, it was the little guy bearing the brunt. Big business was taking his health care. Amnesty for illegals was hurting honest, hard-working Americans. Wall Street and the banks were robbing them of their future. Change a few words here and there and remove the stuff about amnesty, and this part of Bratt's speech sounds like it could have come straight out of a left-winger's talking points. But this was Bratt's unique ability, 
He took typical Republican positions and wrapped them up nicely in a populist argument. He steered clear of social issues like abortion or guns, where he and Cantor agreed, and chose, instead, to focus on the economic impacts of long-cherished Republican neoliberal policies. He used the phrases ruling class and crony capitalism twice in his speech. He also departed from the typical playbook when he addressed immigration. Now, it was nothing new for a Republican to attack immigration policies, but what really resonated with their new Republican base was how Bratt attacked immigration, driving home the point that it, like all other failed government policies, was hurting wages and American workers. Anti-immigrant hysteria can be classified as a racial issue, but it is often masked as a component of class politics. After all, there were times in the past when it was the left that was most adamantly opposed to immigration. Examples of this goes back to the founding of the AFL union and include anti-amnesty campaigns led by the NAACP in the wake of the civil rights movement. The old left hid their racial anxieties under the guise of protecting the quote-unquote worker. And while the new left eventually became more tolerant of immigration, the right eventually adopted the argument and mastered the art of stoking fears of immigration. But Dave Bratt should not be given sole credit for this new invention of right-wing populist rhetoric. Another person who deserves acknowledgement for this was conservative activist John Tanton. You know, when I sit here and I listen to Mr. Bratt speak, I hear the inaccuracies. My family's here. A former Ronald Reagan aide once called John Tanton the most influential unknown man in America. Like Bratt, to whom he made a modest political donation, Tanton's relative obscurity belies the impact he has had on the recent changes in the Republican Party. Tanton was originally a generous liberal philanthropist, a founder of local chapters of Planned Parenthood and Sierra Club. He was eventually ostracized from these progressive groups when he started speaking of eugenics and arguing that the less intelligent individuals should be having fewer children. The quote-unquote less intelligent in Tanton's eyes were, of course, non-white immigrants, a point he made clear when he wrote to a large donor to one of his foundations. One of my prime concerns, Tanton lamented, is about the decline of folks who look like you and me. He elsewhere warned a friend that for European American society and culture to persist requires a European American majority and a clear one at that. Tanton went on to found several organizations, including Numbers USA, the Federation of American Immigration Reform, and the innocuous sounding Center for Immigration Studies. Each and every one of these groups stood in strong opposition to any effort to offer citizenship to undocumented immigrants. These groups mask their founders' racist anxieties and nativist impulses with a quote-unquote pro-worker class struggle approach. They attempted to enlist unions and drafted policy papers on how immigration depressed wages emphasizing the use of the word illegal alien over undocumented to create a sense of us versus them. John Tanton's anti-immigration movement saw its first wave of victories in 1996 when President Clinton signed the Immigrant Responsibility Act. It was a bill that introduced the process of expedited removal to drastically speed up the deportation process. Tanton founded groups continued their winning ways in the 2000s by killing any effort to pass amnesty or the DREAM Act. In addition to lobbying representatives in Washington, they took advantage of their ability to mobilize the grassroots. If a DREAM Act was being suggested for a vote, they could quickly recruit an army of volunteers to flood congressional phone lines. A hallmark of Tanton's tactics and measure of his influence can be seen in the way Bratt, too, articulated his anti-immigration stance in terms of class and not race. 
Dave Bratt wasn't just going to be more hardline on immigration than his opponent. He was going to paint Eric Cantor as part of the elite, someone who was in league with Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Bratt would say Cantor was out of touch with the average person and blast him for a quote, saying we should bring more folks into the country, increase the labor supply, and, by doing so, lower wage rates for the working person, end quote. Dave Bratt pretended this was not about race, and no one should be made to feel like a racist for wanting to protect the border. The real villains were the elites. They were the ones orchestrating the flow of undocumented immigrants as a conspiracy to lower wages for the working class. This was straight out of John Tanton's playbook and Dave Bratt executed the calls masterfully. According to Roy Beck, one of the directors and co-founders of Numbers USA, one of Tanton's organizations, Bratt beat Cantor because, quote, the way journey voters of Representative Cantor's district apparently felt abandoned by his immigration positions that virtually ignore their anxieties about stagnant wages and high unemployment. And that projected primary concern for unlawful foreign visitors and employers seeking more foreign workers. And so, Dave Bratt placed immigration, namely amnesty for what he called illegals, front and center in the primary. And he did so under the guise of class warfare. A vote for Eric Cantor is a vote for open borders. A vote for Eric Cantor is a vote for amnesty, Dave Bratt said at rallies. Fox News host Laura Ingram, who endorsed Bratt, told supporters, Who do you think Barack Obama and Nancy Pelosi want to win in this primary? They want Eric Cantor to win because Eric Cantor is an ally in the biggest fight that will occur in the next six months in Washington, and that is the fight over immigration amnesty. The anti-immigrant group, We Deserve Better PAC, ran a negative ad against Cantor during the primary, with Amnesty and Citizenship for Illegals as one of the main attacks. In their endorsement of Bratt, the right-wing website The American Thinker highlighted concerns over how multiculturalism and third-world immigration guarantee divided loyalty, and how immigrants have an out-of-wedlock birth rate twice that of whites and should expect that such groups would turn to the welfare state and that the melting pot is broken. Immigration was the central issue that propelled Bratt to victory against Cantor. A search of archival articles about the candidates leading up to the primary shows that almost all the headlines make mention of immigration or amnesty. It was the drumbeat of the campaign. Eric Cantor was defensive. His campaign literature was forced to focus on how he was not in favor of amnesty, but the conservative grassroots didn't buy this backtracking from Cantor's earlier position and they let him know with harsh mockery. Dave Bratt stunned the party and defeated Eric Cantor by 10 points, earning 36,000 votes against Cantor's 28,000. The message delivered by Cantor's defeat was not lost on Republican congressional leadership who quickly backed away from any effort to pass immigration reform. The last serious effort during the Obama administration to pass some sort of modified DREAM Act came to an end. Bratt had not only defeated a powerful figure in the Republican Party, he also successfully killed the dream of amnesty for millions of undocumented immigrants. While we can confidently identify immigration as the central issue of the 2014 primary, the question remains why this particular issue was so decisive in galvanizing the Republican base. Did they really buy Dave Bratt's framing of the issue in terms of class? Were they truly convinced that immigration was harmful to American workers? Or did they, like John Tanton, hate immigration out of racial resentment and fear? And this, of course, is a question we often ponder when we think of Donald Trump. I am the least racist person there is anywhere in the world when con men, who I do it all, you know, almost all my business life, because I had to deal with him, unfortunately, in New York. But I got along with him, Al Sharpton. Uh, now, he's a racist.
Whatever opinion I might have about Trumpism, I will be accused of being either a race reductionist on one side or a class reductionist on the other. Because when it comes to the debate over the role of class or race in Trump's win, I sort of fall into the middle category in thinking, it's complicated. It is true that Trump campaigned on racism, but it is also true that in 2016, Hillary Clinton didn't talk enough about class. But I do believe the Republican Party in 2014 and 2016 was forced to answer once and for all the question, how are they going to respond to the demographic changes facing America? The establishment Republicans answered by accepting the inevitable racial changes in the country and learned to adopt by accepting immigration reform. The new base of the Republican Party, however, rejected this approach and argued for the need to fight back against the changes. But this was all happening against the backdrop of an economic situation that was in fact hurting the average worker. In a poll conducted in 2014, 72% of Americans thought the country was still in the Great Recession, despite the fact that it had technically ended years earlier. In other words, the country never felt like it had recovered from the events of the 2008 financial crash. It still felt like it was struggling. It was part of the reason why the Republican base started to turn against its leadership. But in the mixture of class and race, we find the essence of Trumpism. A right-wing resentment against the upper class mixed together with racism and ultra-nationalism. From the 2000s and leading up to Trump's electoral victory in 2016, the percentage of Republican voters saying they were dissatisfied with high levels of immigration had consistently hovered around the 70% range. But in a June 2014 Pew Research poll, 59% of self-described Tea Party Republicans still supported a pathway to citizenship for undocumented immigrants. Meanwhile, in a 2010 poll, 55% of Tea Party Republicans still said they were concerned that someone in their household will be out of the job in the next year. On top of this, more than two-thirds said the Great Recession had been difficult or caused hardship and major life changes. And polling consistently with most Americans, they thought the most important issues were the economy and jobs. Tea Party Republicans tend to be better off than the average American, but that did not mean they did not have struggles that would translate into political mobilization. In the end, I would argue that the reason Dave Bratt or Donald Trump hammered on immigration issue is because they wanted to win the racist vote. But knowing that wasn't enough, they also knew that Americans were struggling economically, but had no real economic answers to their problems, and so they said immigration was to blame. Bratt's attack on Cantor and Trump's attack on Clinton was a two birds with one stone approach. The argument reached out to both those with racist resentment as well as to voters dealing with genuine class struggles. A few months after Trump's announcement, in September of 2015, Marco Rubio was on stage at the Values Voters Summit. He had just received word that John Boehner had finally stepped down as House Speaker and he delivered the news to the crowd which erupted in wild cheers. Just a few minutes ago, Speaker Boehner announced that he will be resigning. Yeah! Rubio was visibly shaken as he expected a different response. The moment showed that the Republican leadership had lost control of the party. In that same month, all polls would consistently place Donald Trump in the lead for the Republican nomination. By the time of this video essay in 2023, the Republican Party is the party of Trumpism. Unlike their counterparts in the Reagan or Bush years, these new Republicans claim to be representing the worker. Their fundraising may still come from big businesses and they may have no interest in supporting pro-labor policies like collective bargaining rights or mandatory paid leave, but their rhetoric has changed. Their dog whistles have been tuned to a different pitch. And to the question of the eventual demographic changes of America, they are no longer going to reach out to the growing Latino base. They will instead attempt to woo the white worker who may have previously voted Democrat. This is the legacy of the 2014 Virginia Republican primary. Dave Bratt might be a footnote in history, but like Trump, he's an interesting case of failing upwards. He was an economist with no economic solutions to economic problems. 
So he blamed immigrants, and his inaccurate diagnosis of the material problems of the day ended up winning over an entire party. How long the Republicans will continue to fail upwards and win elections through Trumpism is a mystery. But so long as fears of demographic changes continue to muddle the issues of class and race, we can expect even more shocking upsets in the future of American elections, ones that might even dwarf the impacts of both the 2014 and 2016 Republican primaries.